In fact, I will just cut to the chase because the first thing we see on this Thursday Raw Thursday show, which aired February 13th, 1997, is the announcement that Shawn Michaels is going to forfeit the WWF championship. That came out of nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. And they played sad music with slow motion clips of Shawn with a belt. Was this anything at all like Daniel Bryan's announcement? <laughs> no. Okay. Ah. The video package for this show was... His announcement was when the show started, they showed his tweet. Yeah. And then nothing happened for I'm hours. actually not sure which was worse now that I think about it. <laughs> WWE made this seem like a very serious deal in 1997. And it was a very serious deal in 2015, but really that's how you announce it, his tweet? Yeah. So... The intro for the show was just clips of the guys in the show doing moves and the narrator saying, Thursday, raw Thursday, over and over again. I suspect this was made in two minutes. Or done live. For what I believe is their very first matchup, Rocky Maivia versus Hunter Hearst Helmsley for the Intercontinental Championship. This match was actually great. First of all, they started doing chain wrestling, and Vince McMahon is calling out holds. So he does know things like a hammerlock and a sit-out and leverage. That's impressive. I was amazed when, I'm not sure what match it was, but he called a single leg. Yeah, Brett, Brett did one. Vince McMahon. Yeah, an ankle pick. So Ross says Triple H is the most cerebral. Isn't it weird that we sit here and we can't believe that Vince McMahon knows some wrestling, About wrestling. moves? Yeah. It's just, it's, <laughs> It, it's and come on. It is baffling. It is baffling, but it's also baffling that we think that. Well, it's his He's the fault. most successful wrestling promoter of all time. How could he not know wrestling moves? Because he hates wrestling. So, Ross called Triple H the most cerebral intercontinental champion since the Honky Tonk Man, and Vince cackled. So the story of this match was, Triple H was the reigning intercontinental champion. Rocky Maivia was the very, very talented, but very, very green rookie. So Hunter took 80% of the match, and every time Rocky made a comeback, it would be big flying moves, but then Hunter would lure him into making a mistake, and Rocky would crash and burn in spectacular fashion. He'd miss a drop kick and go splat, or he'd do a body press, but Hunter would roll through for a pin, or whatever. So Hunter was, in fact, you putting his experience to good use. Hunter had a pile driver, which was very weird to see. He started to get cocky at this point, set Rock up on the top rope, Slapped him a lot for hitting a superplex. And Rock was kicking out, out of all these big moves. So Hunter went for his big gun, the pedigree. But Rock was so limp, Hunter couldn't even get him in position for the move. He'd go to, go to hook an arm, and Rock would just fall to the mat. So Honky Tonk Man, who had made an appearance at the announce desk, clarifying that neither of these men were good enough to be his protege. No. But he starts screaming at Hunter, Roll him over! Pin him! You got the man beat! But Hunter is an arrogant prick. So he keeps going for this pedigree. Rock keeps falling. Hunter steps back to do his, his bow. And he goes to pick Rock up again. And Rock gets a small package out of nowhere for the pin. Honky Tonk Man was Larry Zbysko in this match. He was. He was Larry Zbysko. He was right. He knew what was coming and he was right. I was amazed at how light the Rock was. And I'm not just like, wait. I'm talking, he threw these drop kicks that would not have broken an egg. Yeah. Hunter bumping all over the place for him. Another reason why I'm sure all of these old-timers thought Rock was just the best. Oh, yeah. God, he's big and agile, and he'll never touch you. Never hurt you. Yeah. So immediately after the win, Doc Hendricks interviewed uh, Rocky on the floor, and Rocky said he was always going to give the best he could. True. And uh, he dedicated the win to his grandfather and dad, and this was not The Rock. It's not like this was a great promo you wanted to go out and see, but there have been a lot of successful pro wrestlers who never got this good at promos right away. Where he never got this good at promos as Rock was right away. Now, granted, to be fair, the die, Rocky, die chants have not started yet. But there was a Rocky sucks chant at the beginning of the there, match. There were some boos, scattered boos. Now, we will see where this goes in the future. But I think it's going to be kind of funny. I could be completely wrong. But everybody, in hindsight, remembers all of these die, Rocky, die chants. And the fans were turning on Rocky. And so they ended up turning him heel this whole story. But this was long before the John Cena era. This was long before the Roman Reigns Royal Rumble era. And I want to see how much they actually turned on The Rock. 
Because while there were Die Rocky Die chants and boos at the beginning of this match, by the end of this match, he was universally cheered when he won the championship. Mm -hmm. Everybody went crazy for the guy. He was a huge babyface when all was said and done, despite some chants early. I want to see if it remains like that or if they actually boo him throughout all of the matches. Sonny came out. We've heard many times when men have... Their, their employment with WWE has ceased. And they will say that they were told, we just don't have anything for you. Well, if there was ever any doubt that was a lie, this company had nothing for Sonny to do, but they still put her on TV every week. That's right. She hasn't managed anyone in months. She hasn't had any rivalry with Marlene or anything, but they keep putting her out to be a random commentator. She hasn't even had a regular interview segment. They put her in karate fighters. They had her doing a ring announcer here because she was really hot. That's the point. Yeah. She was not... This is not like Adam Rose. No. You don't want to trot that guy out every week. No, you do not. So she was the ring announcer for this match for oh, no reason. Oh, man. The irony of this, the weaker porn tape came out. Yeah. I was going to keep this a secret, but what the hell? So it appears that Vivid has sent a box of Sunny DVDs to, of all fucking places, I'm not making this up, Sports Byline USA for our show. Yep. We will be doing some contests and okay, giving good. away. Oh, good. Sunny I was so DVDs terrified you were going to say review. On hell fucking no. Yeah. Sports Byline USA. On the Sports Byline you're giving them away. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, what better show? I don't know. There isn't one. <laughs> there's no there is no better show. I don't know. I don't know if there's a porn podcast. I don't think so. But of course there is. Well, if there is, there's, there's, still, there's still no better show than ours yeah. to give this away. In the world. Well, anyway, she was out here to do ring announcing for Bob Holly and Aldo Montoya versus the Headbangers. Announcers, by the way, all night long were bemoaning the fate of poor Shawn Michaels. God. All his great matches. I mean, always gave it his all. Except tonight, apparently. They spent the whole match by the way talking about Sean and barely talking about the match at all, and I do not blame them. It was the headbangers versus Aldo Montoya and Sparkplug. Yeah, but you know what? Bob Holly was really good. He was. And uh I mean, I noticed it all throughout this show, but these guys taking the bumps on this ring. Holy shit. It was a very hard ring. Honest to God, you would have been better off taking bumps on the cement. Yeah. It'd have been safer. So Vince blamed himself for the arduous schedule that he had made Sean Wrestle's champion. The most difficult schedule any champion has ever faced, they said. I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. Oh, yeah? Talk about how sad it was to see a young kid in his prime realizing his dream, how sad it was to be cut down like this. Tell me more! 31. Yes. Making a million excuses about how Sean couldn't go into the ring and give 99%. He had to give 100%, so he had no choice. How ironic, because he went into the ring about 10 minutes later and gave maybe 40%. That's very charitable. It, it, it It's astonishing. Some ads aired for other USA Network shows, most of which looked terrible, but there was also Duckman, which was great. So, Aldo got the hot tag. He made his comeback. Headbangers did a horrendous job of feeding him. And they pinned him with a powerbomb leg drop combo that looked so horribly mistimed and very nearly fatal. And then the team with the 1980s heavy metal name and a 1990s grunge music gimmick started dancing to 1970s punk music. Hey, why not? I don't know. So it was time. Vince and Gorilla Monsoon are in the ring because Gorilla, of course, was the uh, commissioner or president or whichever. President. Yeah. He was the figurehead. That should, that should have just been his title. Figurehead? Graphic. Gorilla On Monsoon. screen guy. G Monsoon figurehead. Sean came out, a lot of booze, and we've been watching this show every week now for several months. Never seen Sean limp like this. Never seen anyone limp like this, actually. <laughs> I mean, his knee was hurt. He, he had a bad knee. You know what happened? Essentially, but why don't you enlighten, remind me and enlighten everyone else. Well, Sean claimed that he might need, I believe he was trying to say reconstructive knee surgery, but I'm not sure exactly what he spit out. Yeah. Well, turned out he needed four weeks of rehab yeah. and no surgery. Yeah. Even better. Yeah. His first, 
I don't. Even, I can't remember how long it was before he came back, but I will never forget the very first thing he did when he came back was a backflip off the top rope. Yeah, landed on his. I do remember that. And then you had one of my favorite matches of the '90s in WWE, which everyone's going to hear this and they're not going to believe their ears. But it was Shawn Michaels and Steve Austin against Owen and Bulldog. Yes. And Shawn worked the whole fucking match like a king. I was blown away by how awesome he was. I shouldn't have been in hindsight. Yeah, yeah. So, first thing I, all I wanted to think was, what are the other guys who have been in and around wrestling all their lives thinking right now? What was going through Gorilla Monsoon's mind? That's what I was thinking. Same thing with Lawler. Listen. Probably thinking the same thing I was when I looked at those other guys with their hands in the ice. Yeah. If you could, I know, I know he had a bad knee. If you can walk to the ring unassisted, <laughs> well, you can do something to drop this title. I think the key is that there were other problems. Well, there's that too. This was unbelievable. This promo, Sean Cut. I got to go back and 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 see what I wrote at the time because I don't think I realized at the time just how bad this guy was. I thought he was just really sad. Now I look back and you know, I'm like... It, it, it was pathetic. I spent too much time in wrestling afterwards. <laughs> I saw this many times. Yeah. And it was not due to knee injuries. No. <laughs> no. No. He was out of his mind. Couldn't spit anything out. Mumbling a lot. Slurring his speech. Losing his train of thought as he's cutting his promo about dropping the title was his boyhood dream. He lost his focus during this. It was always about two performance, he said. Two performance. <laughs> he fucked it up twice trying to get it right. He did not use these exact words. It was very, very close. Talked about being a limousine riding jet flying champion. And the big moment came. <laughs> I still can't believe this. Gorilla's behind him. Vince is interviewing him. Gorilla's behind him. And he turns his back to Vince, turns to Gorilla, and says, quote, I guess, here you go, here's your belt. Yeah. Done! And then he drops the famous line, which is about the 14th least offensive thing about this whole deal. But he explains he's lost a lot of things. One of them was his smile. Oh. He's got to go find his smile. The ladies in the audience weeping and grown, wailing. Grown women who had spent hundreds of dollars at the merchandise stand. Now realize it wasted those hundreds of dollars. It was so amazing to watch this because back then, unless you recorded it on a VCR, it was one and done. Yeah, there was no replay, there was no DVR. You had to v, you had to v, you had to put it on a VHS tape and rewind it. Which I don't know how many people did. I'm sure a lot of wrestling fans did, but it was really the aftermath that was legendary. Tell me a lie. Oh God! And the video package they aired on nine billion shows over and over again to make this seem like such an important deal. But at the time, as he's doing this deal, there are women crying and all the men are heckling. They're all heckling this man. Openly booing. Openly booing that this guy is crying about his knee and vacating the title while he's all fucked up. It's just amazing he's he was a little younger than daniel bryan when he did this alleged retirement promo he may never wrestle again daniel bryan's speech was so unbelievably great and then there's this guy yeah just his trainer by the way his trainer i wonder what little daniel bryan thought when he watched this That's i wonder a if he great cried. question i wonder if he cried and didn't get it either like i didn't at the time <laughs> The two most, I, I didn't even want to summarize this because I was so, 19 years later, I was so angry about this. I wanted to cool down before I wrote down how I really felt. But all I could, the, the two things I could think was, one, it must be a really good thing to be in this company and be Vince's friend. Because Vince is in charge. And if Vince is cool with what you're doing, everyone else has to be cool with what you're doing too. How do they let him on TV though? Even if I you're his friend. I mean, there was no other option, I guess. It was live. It, well, I mean, maybe they didn't know. Maybe they didn't know until he got out there on television. I don't have any idea. They did say the last time we saw anyone in this state on a live TV was Jeff Hardy's title match against Sting. And the story from everyone in TNA that day was 
Jeff he vanished for a long time. And he was fine when we saw him earlier. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Sean vanished for a while. So the other thing was they put him on TV like this and did this whole thing about him dropping the title and maybe disappearing. It's not like th- this was not like today when they can do whatever they want and they've already driven off all the, the casual fans. So the people who are watching now, there's nothing else for them to watch. They can't, they can't turn away. And I realize this is also a Thursday show and not Monday, but still they were in a war. They were fighting for their existence. And this is the route they took. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Well, what the hell were you going to do? Your champion decided he wasn't going to wrestle ever again and wasn't going to drop the title or do an injury angle. <laughs> You're rather limited. He fucked everything up. Yeah, he did. He really, really did. He fucked everything up. I when would... you when you see where this goes over the next three months, you yeah. will realize all the things this guy fucked up. Oh, it's a, it's a long, long list. I would have said, fine, don't go on TV, and I would have... Cut a promo saying Shawn Michaels was savagely beaten in the parking lot. There's no video. <laughs> Clearly another parking lot beating for something, Shawn Michaels. Something better than this. This was bad. This is, uh, you know what? Watching this, it's believable that men want to beat Shawn Michaels up in a parking lot. Oh, Vinny. This poor guy. He's having a rough time. He needed to go home and find a smile. Yeah, I had to go find a smile. So, and by the way, let me say again, this is my favorite wrestler ever. <laughs> Maybe this is why I got so mad. You know, he had his ups and his downs. He had, so he had some downs. So they went to commercial. They come back. The announcers, and again, it's Vince who is on Sean's side, and Jim Ross and Lawler who have to pretend to be on Sean's side. And I cannot, for the life of me, imagine they were in real life. You'd have to ask them. But my best guess is they were not. But they're all talking about this tragic occurrence. Okay, very sentimental. And thank God the Nation of Domination music interrupted. Never been so happy in my life to hear PG-13. Yeah, I was until they came out to do their rap, and they didn't remember any of the words. They, they fucked, they maybe, what the hell was going on here? hanging out with Sean. <laughs> this was like a horrible night for a lot of guys. Uh, yeah, they, they just said Savio's name over and over. Now, worse, it led to Savio Vega versus The It was like Motorhead at WrestleMania that one year. They couldn't remember any of the words for Hunter's song. Yes. And they just kept saying the same line over and over again. <sighs> so Savio wrestled The Undertaker for days. You know what's funny? There was some shit in this match. Undertaker did some sort of leg drop thing and nearly killed the guy. Yeah. And he gave him a backdrop. And you know what? Let me say something here. This is this is the God's honest. When I say these guys would have been better off bumping on the cement than in that ring, it sounds like I'm being sarcastic. But... You can correct me if I'm wrong, Vinny, as a football historian. Back when they wore the pigskin helmets, mm-hmm. there were less head injuries. Because guys didn't run fucking full force into people with their heads like they do now because they got these helmets on. Essentially. I mean, they, they would put on helmets because guys were dying on the field. Well, but, that's uh, bad. Yeah. But, but uh, there, there has, it has been said that if you take the face masks off, everyone will stop hitting each other with their heads. Yes, exactly. Yeah. If if I had to take a bump on the cement, I would do it in a very controlled fashion, as safely as I could. These guys did not do that when they had to take a bump in this ring, and this fucking ring was harder than shit. Yeah. God, he took this backdrop, and I was like, oh, Savio. I like, you mentioned this. Savio goes for a backdrop, and I think Taker's idea was, I will counter this with a fame asser. And what happened was, his whole body came down on Savio, and they both just crumbled to the earth. So it went a long time. And Taker hit a choke slam and won. The whole nation hit the ring to attack Taker. Ahmed ran out to make the save, and the baby faces cleared the ring. Yeah. Yes. Hendricks interviewed Monsoon backstage. Monsoon explained that the final four match, instead of being uh instead of the winner being named top contender, the winner would be champion. And then Sid, who was supposed to get a title shot on this show, he would get a title shot on Monday after the pay-per-view. This all makes sense. And did we mention after the match, by the way, that the PG-13 geeks hit the ring and then Ahmed ran out and made the save? Yes. Okay. I was distracted. That's fine. Uh, Steve Austin versus Psycho Sid. This is the first time, I believe, that Austin has been the overwhelming crowd favorite. They were in, I think, Massachusetts somewhere. But uh, the crowd loved Austin tonight. Let me talk about this match. I got one thing I got to say above all else. You know the old phrase, such and such is a stiff... Yes. Okay. I know where you're going with this. Sid 
was a stiff. And that is a legitimate observation. Yeah. I'm not saying that to be a dick. There was a spot where he was on the apron and his upper body rolled outside and nothing bent. He was completely rigid, perfectly straight. He bent nowhere. And I'm writing this down. This guy is a stiff and he's rigid and he doesn't bend anywhere at any time. And as I am writing this, Stone Cold Steve Austin, who I have great respect for, he decides, I've got an idea. I am going to put Sid in an abdominal stretch. Yeah. The operative word being stretch. Unfortunately, Sid does not stretch. No. Sid does not bend. Sid is completely rigid, and it is the worst abdominal stretch ever in the history of pro wrestling. It's so bad, he cannot even wrap his arm around the guy's head. He essentially just drapes his arm over Sid's body as Sid struggles to bend. It was amazing. And then, by the way, different ways Sid is no good. He escapes this abdominal stretch, and the spot is Austin will whip him into the ropes. Sid will reverse it and then hit a sleeper. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? No. I know where you're going. All right. This was the worst sleeper I've ever seen. <laughs> even, even before that, just the, the, the reversal. That ring is 20 by 20 feet, right? Yeah. That's 400 square feet. I am certain Sid at one point was in all 400 <laughs> of those square feet. He was all over the place here. And he put him in a horrible sleeper. The horrible leg drop that he missed. Is a horrible miss. Worst leg, leg like, drop of all time. Sid's a notoriously bad wrestler, and this is one of his bad nights. This is one way that he can bend. He can bend in a leg drop position. But that's it. Yeah. Because he goes for the leg drop, he lands on his ass, and then he goes completely rigid. Yeah. Flat. <laughs> and then, and then, I will say it again. I have great respect for Stone Cold Steve Austin. But his next idea is, well... The abdominal stretch didn't work. I'll try a fucking sharp shooter. Well, guess who doesn't bend? Sid. Sid! So, of course, it doesn't work. And finally, Brett runs in and attacks Austin for the DQ. Saving wrestling. Now, I will add that at the beginning of this match, Austin kicked him right in the balls, right in front of the ref. That's not a DQ. So we've learned that you can kick a man in the balls, but if another man runs in, that's a DQ. So Sid runs in, or excuse me, Brett runs in and attacks Austin. This, of course, gets Sid disqualified, so Sid loses. So Sid is pissed. He yells at Brett, and they get into a brawl. And if there has ever been a greater disparity in the quality of worked punches between two men in a brawl, I don't know what it would be. Like I say, Sid was a bad wrestler. This was one of his bad nights. So they go backstage. And Vince is on commentary, so we hear his disembodied voice do an interview with, as he called him, Mr. Vader. <laughs> Mr. Vader. Mr. Vader. And it was bad. Vader cut a bad promo about, I, I believe his point was, I've beaten Taker at the pay-per-view, I beat up Austin twice, and tonight I'm going to beat Brett. Yeah. That's it was a bad promo, but at the end, when it was all said and done, he got to look in the camera and he got to ask what time it was, and who was the man. That was two lines that he could deliver well. That's right. They replay the Lost My Smile promo. Davy Boy Smith and Owen Hart versus Farouk and Crush. Now, I realize Davy Boy and Owen were doing this dissension tease, but still, you know your tag team division is thin when you have heel champions, and the only guys you have to face them are two singles heels put together. Yes, they were in a stable, but it's not like there was a great Farouk and Crush tag team run. No. You know, they cut backstage during this match, and there's Bret Hart. And... Yes. I was going to comment that, my God, they're making him face the camera and crane his neck all the way around to pretend like he's looking at the television. I can't believe it. This may be the first time I've seen this going back that far. Yes. Well, I found out why they did it, because then he was going to turn and look at the camera yes. and do a promo. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Problem is, today you're not allowed to look at the camera. No. So it's stupid to be facing the camera and craning your neck to look at the fucking TV. Yeah. No, wrestling today sucks. You're right.
And my God, he rambled forever about Shawn Michaels. I was so excited for this, and what a letdown! Because and and this is an amazing problem in hindsight, but the problem was Brett was a loyal soldier. Well, and I realize why that's amazing. I I hate to be a spoiler, but the reason he was a loyal soldier was he was just about to win the title. Well, that's true too. And granted, he was just about to lose it. That's I don't also know if they true. told him that part. Yeah. But he was like, oh, man, too bad Sean's gone. I wish the guy the best. I hope I, he finds a smile. I'd love to settle my score, but I just hope he gets back in the ring. <laughs> what a baby face. I also like the talking about Sean's promo, and Ross asked, when was the last time you heard an athlete thank the fans? Well, all the goddamn time. How about the beginning of the show in Rock 1? <laughs> you thank the fans. Yeah. So, let's see. Between the uh, early commercial and Brett's promo, we missed a good chunk of the match. Let's see. Owen was getting the crowd to chant for Bulldog. Owen was being a bad tag team partner, by which I mean he would go to try to make the save, but this would distract the ref, and so Bulldog would get, get double teamed. Finally, Owen makes his comeback. And then he gets thrown out of the ring, and he fakes a knee injury and gets countered out. Again. On this show. Yep. <laughs> on this show, we have a man accused of faking a knee injury. Let me tell you the worst goddamn move in the world, by the way is the Dominator on this hard-ass ring. Mm. Solid point. So because Owen was claiming his knee injury, that meant he was unable to... He got, he, he got counted out. He was unable to get back in the ring and save Bulldog as the Nation of Domination killed him. So they gave him the Dominator, and they left. Funniest part was they're leaving, and uh, they're, all, they're, they're all leaving together. like they, they are split in two and coming on opposite sides of the ring. And poor D'Lo, who was just a nameless guy at this point, just a nameless flunky. But he goes to leave and then realizes Owen is blocking his path and he has nowhere to go. So D'Lo just backs up and disappears. <laughs> so Bulldog is totally fooled by Owen's act. He is helping his brother-in-law limp to the back. And they take two or three steps. And then Owen remembers, wait, my slammy. And he walks back to get it. Yeah. Owen was great. I know I say that every week, but it's always true. And this led to Bret Hart versus Vader. They did their entrances, and then Taker's whole light show went off. And whoever was in charge of filling the arena with Taker's smoke went double overtime on this. <laughs> because I swear, Taker was invisible cutting this promo. I vaguely remember this. I, I don't remember the story behind it, but I remember it happening. I don't know if it was bad ventilation or something happened with some pyro, but it was like they were wrestling in the clouds. When, this was like a match in heaven. I, I compared it to the yeah, thick fog near the ocean. Yeah, there, there, there was a there was a famous football game called the Fog Bowl when uh, a, a thing was in Chicago and a huge huge fog cloud came in off the Great Lakes and just enveloped the stadium. And you could barely see anything, and it was a playoff game, I think. But anyway, when Taker's cutting this promo, I'm not making this up. In that I thought he was still backstage and he was just you know you hear Taker's voice over the, the over the arena. And then they're showing, like, the entranceway, but it's just purple. That's all you can see. And then slowly it dissipates, and you see Taker is there. Then you see there's another figure there, and you can't tell who that is. And by the time it clears up, you can see his Taker. He's, he's got Doc Hendricks for some reason. I guess he grabbed his mic. But Taker leaves, and then Brett and Vader wrestled in smoke so thick, I can't believe they didn't get sick. I also love it when Brett, you know, Vader's the Mastodon. He's the monster. He's, I think, the biggest guy in the company at this point. And Brett is the technician who's all about having better scientific skill than anyone else. So Brett, of course, whips out power slams and back suplexes, suplexes, just throwing the monster around. They're doing this match. You could hear the ref tell them to take it home. And the finish was actually brilliant. Brett dodges a corner charge. Vader takes the corner charge, chest for, corner charge chest first. And as he is stumbling backwards out of the corner, Brett gets on his hands and knees and Vader trips over him. Brett goes to the sharpshooter, Vader gets the ropes, and then Austin appears in the balcony to distract Brett. Vader cuts him off and tries a Vader bomb, but Austin dares him, go up top and do the moonsault. And Vader obliged, Brett dodged, Vader missed, and Brett pinned him. Yeah. I do love, by the way, this is the thing they never do anymore. They always call splash, they call anything on the top rope a high-risk move, but no one ever misses a top rope move and then just gets pinned. They get a top rope move. They miss a top rope move. Yeah, that's because they changed the rings. Well, that helps, it's too. very believable that this man missed a top rope moonsault and was dead. That helps, too. But if you believe a man is actually taking his life in his hands when he goes to the top rope, it will mean more. 
Somebody on Raw needs to miss a top rope top rope move and get pinned immediately. Um, they kind of do it every now and then. Where it, it's not exactly like that, but so the, the, a guy the, goes up top, he misses. The guy gets his move off the top, and he wins. They that's do different. that one a lot. That is different. Yeah, I want man misses t- move off top rope, man gets pinned. Well, that's kind of what's happening. But the guy that wins has to be so cocky that he has to hit his move. Yes, he has or to, he just wants to perform for the fans. He has to get his shit in. Yeah, that, that's worse though. I guess. Well, the if you if you're if you're Neville, mm-hmm. you really want to show off your move. You don't want to just hit the guy after he misses a moonsault. But pinning him right after the move misses would emphasize to fans that missing top rope that moves is, is true. dangerous. That is true. But you could still say in storyline that you know he missed and so he couldn't get up to get out of the way for the red arrow because he fucked up his high risk move. So uh, the show ends. Brett gets the pin. And then Austin and Brett are trying to get at get at each other, and uh, that was the end of the show. The first match and the last match were good. The middle matches were no good, and that angle was pathetic. The Sean Angle, mm-hmm. it's legendary. It is. That's not a good thing. No, not every time. No. I, 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 can someone tell me if they changed the lyrics to "Tell Me a Lie" on the WWE Network? I think they do. I don't know if they have the rights to that song. I see. Yeah. Somebody let me know because that would be a great. I mean, it's online. You can find it on the internet, but it'd be very sad if that legendary song was scrubbed from history on the WWE network. Tell me a lie. I can't even remember it. But it's some bullshit like that. Why did you do that? I don't know. It's just, it's stuck in my head. <laughs> what inspired you? Because <laughs> it was a great song. How many times did you watch that video, Vinny? Millions. I will say this. uh, I do remember the the final shot was it was after his other beating in the parking lot where he had to to lose a title without getting pinned in the ring. When he handed over. Maybe that's when they played Tell Me a Lie. Was it not after this? You know what? No, I think it's 97. No, 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 no. no. It was. They played after this, but they used that shot because Sean walked away from titles so often they had so many shots to use. Yeah, you found it. No. Well. That's the black guy. But if he, I think that's after the Dean Douglas angle because. That is. That's after the Dean. That's what I'm saying, though. Yeah, the still that, the, shot. The, the shot they used at the end, it's it's after that moment, and he's wearing, like, he's got a black guy and, like, the blue and black jacket, and he turns his back and slowly walks up the aisle. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, that. my point is, I remember that shot of the video. This was. This was 1995. Damn it. WWF Raw, February 17th, 1997. Opened with, allegedly, Bret Hart versus Psycho Sid for the WWF title. Yeah, that was going to open up the show. Yep. That was their claim. Bret had just won the championship the night before at the Final Four pay-per-view. If we haven't mentioned this, one other cool thing from this era, Sid's pyro. Sid in giant letters hanging above the ring. Oh, yeah. That's very cool. They then announced that, for no reason... Literally no reason. The Undertaker will be challenging for the title at Mania. Just because. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Why? I don't know. He didn't win the Fatal 4-Way. He lost the Fatal 4-Way. He lost. Why didn't Vader get it? Because he got pinned? Was that the deal? Because Undertaker didn't get pinned, he gets a championship match? I don't know. Doesn't seem fair. So this match did not not happen. Steve Austin hit the ring, started brawling with Brett. See, this this right here, when when I look back at it, I'm happy I watch these shows. Because when Austin chop blocked Sid, and I got to see Sid sell, that was that actually is it's already making me feel better. I may be healed by the end of the show thinking about this. So there was in fact a brawl, and Austin did chop block Sid, and Sid's selling was to roll to the apron and scream into the camera, "Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! Damn it!" That was his selling. And then after he'd been selling for a while. He gets up, and I guess a fan had been belittling him or something. And Sid looks at the fan in full view of the camera and the mics, and he screams, That motherfucker hit me in my leg, asshole. That was his comeback. Somebody to this told fan. me about this, and I was watching for it, and I didn't see it. Right? How did you not see this? Go back and watch it right it's now. fucking hilarious. I was looking for it. That motherfucker hit me in my leg, asshole. How dare this fan heckle Sid? Some motherfucker hit him in his leg. This is a t-shirt begging this to be This fan was being an asshole. Yes. And then the fans were just chanting for Sid. Yeah. So. That was awesome. 
Sid still wanted his match even on one leg, and eventually they were separated, and they showed Sean dropping the title from Thursday before. They showed at the Final Four, Vader suffered a gruesome, bloody facial injury. Oh, man. That no fun. And what a close-up, bloody photograph they showed us. Yeah. Not like today. No. They're, they're like, here's a close-up of this giant gash with blood spewing everywhere on the man's face. We're going to zoom in super tight see if we can see his skull. And Steve Austin, they said, also hyperextended his knee when he was thrown out of the ring. So Taker and Brett were the last two. I guess that's why Taker gets the shot, because he is the best loser. I guess. It's not a good reason. So there was lots of interference from Austin, and eventually Brett won. They go to commercial, and they go backstage. Kevin Kelly attempts to interview Sid, but Sid is too awesome to be interviewed. <laughs> Kelly gets about three words in, and Sid just screams, Shut up! <laughs> I love Sid! And Sid was so great. He's going on about how this... Thank God he's a champion again. Yes. He's not going to let this keep him down. He's the master, the ruler of the master and ruler of the world, and he says not even a broken leg will stop him from being world champion. Turns out he was wrong about that. God. No, he was right. He didn't break his leg here. No, but he won the championship. That was later. <laughs> well, I that know broken you... leg did in fact stop him from winning anything. You know, it really did. Mark Merrow versus Savio Vega. Thank God PG thirteen figured out how to rap again this week after last week's debacle. They promised repeatedly the world championship match would happen later. So Sable had been uh, attacking dudes in Mero matches. She kicked Undertaker. She slapped Leaf Cassidy. So here, when the Nation Geeks were going after Mero on the floor, she fought them off with kicks. Then they realized, wait a minute, there's eight of us against one woman. And they chased her into the ring. Ref called for the DQ before anyone could even lay a hand on anybody. And then Ahmed Johnson came out in salmon-colored pajamas. <laughs> yeah, that's exact. He was a giant salmon. That's what he was. It's just astonishing. With a board. He t- cleared the ring with a two-by-four. And almost fell down doing it. Of course he did. This, I, this segment sucked. I picture Ahmed Johnson almost falling down routinely throughout the day. The only good thing about this was the music, the Nation of Domination music, and Farouk playing Mil Muertes, sitting in the crowd. Yes. And just commanding in, in, his... In the rafters, in fact. Yeah. Yeah. Brett did a backstage promo saying Austin was always on, always going to be on his back. He'd have to get used to that. He said Sid would get his title shot tonight, and after that, he moved on to the other challengers who were in line. The highlight here was when he told Lawler to shut up. Yeah, him and Lawler, they're trying to interview him, but Lawler is yelling at him during the interview. And so Brett says... You know, shut up. They yell at each other like you noted. And then Lawler offered to go massage Sid's knee. So badly he didn't like Bret Hart. He still holds a grudge for that kiss my foot match. Which was like years ago. Three years ago at this point, I think. Two or three. That was back when Lawler had a long memory. Yeah. Now he can't even remember what happened on last week's show. Leaf Cassidy versus Rocky Maivia. <laughs> what was wrong with this? A lot. Now... Sunny. They introduced both men, the Intercontinental Champion and his challenger. Then they brought the real main event, Sunny, the time or not, the bell ringer. The bell ringer. She rang the bell. But she did very well. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, lots of ECW signs in the crowd. Coincidence, I'm sure. Oh, of course. You know, it was very obvious. We've been talking about Roman Reigns and how everybody doesn't like him or they boo him at Raw and everyone harkens back oh do you remember when there were Rocky sucks chance and die Rocky die and so they turned him heel what's funny is I'm sure it must get more vociferous it has to right oh, it will because if this this right here yeah he got some boos. There's 5% of the fans that don't like him. And was mostly And cheered. it's not even passionate dislike. It's just boo. No. But yes. I mean, this is nothing like we get nowadays. No. This is downright tame. Yeah. There's more to come. But it is pretty clear that having Sonny go out there and salivate all over the rock was doing him no favors also true. with these fans. Also true. So I they... can't believe they didn't figure that out. <laughs> Sonny was out there to plug her appearance on Entertainment Tonight who was doing a feature on her because she was the most downloaded celebrity on America Online. <laughs> yeah. And when I wrote that down, I thought, I'm, I'm writing about the Ming Dynasty. Ancient history. 
We got God, one. You remember how long it used to take to download one of her pictures? It'd be like 30 minutes. I miss the uh, the feedback noise you would get from your dial-up modem when you're connecting to anything online. <laughs> you miss it? Yeah, I do, actually. Wow. Yeah. Rock did 1,000 arm drags in this match. Triple H did an inset promo saying Rock got lucky when he won the IC title and he still had a, scored a settle with Goldust, too. I was sitting there thinking about how boring this was when a boring chant broke out. In the middle of a leaf cast of the arm bar, I thought, I'm going outside to check on my cats. Go outside. Cats are sitting in the yard, just sitting there. I went back inside. I was very sad to see the match was still going on. Much, much later, the Rock made his comeback. Yeah. I'm already happy. Yeah! <laughs> That's how you knew you were connected to the World Wide Web. That's how you knew... Okay, mine, mine never went this long. <laughs> yeah, mine never did I that. I will say this. That, that is more irritating than mine. That's how you knew your prodigy connection was working. That's what I had. Okay, now for all of you youngsters, if I can remember, I will alert you when the photograph of Sonny will have finished downloading. Yes. Stand by. Correct. They went to a split screen to show Jerry Lawler fucking with a fan with an ECW sign, which... At the time, I thought, how could anyone have believed there was no connection between these two? And then it turned out one segment later, they everyone knew anyway. So, seven, eight hours into this rock one with a shoulder breaker. Then the the real important thing, Lawler cut his promo on ECW. Said that 99% of people had never heard of him. There's a company in Philadelphia full of has-beens and never was He said, my friends tried to take a Jerry Lawler sign into a WCW event, and they took the sign away. And then... They announced that would never happen because we believe in freedom of speech in the WWF. Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha! That was amazing. He invited, Lawler did, ECW to show up at next week's Raw in Manhattan. And show us what you've got. Yeah. So this segment was very bizarre for very many different reasons. Do you talk about young Hunter doing his promo during this match? I mentioned it briefly, but... He said he has unfinished business with Gold Dust. He is coming after The Rock because Triple H always gets what he wants. <laughs> oh, I'll have more to say about ah. Hunter. I will have more to say about Hunter soon, I believe. We got Gold Dust and Marlena coming out for a promo. They showed Gold Dust distracting Hunter at the pay per view, leading to Rocky pinning him with a German suplex. And they talked about Marlena being attacked by a fan. A fan. Pay-per-view. Which, for those of you who are not aware, turned out to be China. What a fan. Yeah. So Ross is talking about some celebrity couple, couples and drops a Nashville Network reference. I thought that was interesting, considering where they ended up a few years later. So Goldust's promo is that Hunter had made an indecent proposal to Marlena, but he would never get close to her except over Goldust's dead body. Marlena addressed questions about Goldust's masculinity and manhood. She assured everyone that despite the games they played, Goldust was all man. She said that Goldust was more of a man than Triple H would ever be. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if he hears his show, it's going to be Hunter and Goldust at WrestleMania this year. He's got to prove his manhood. Well, it's funny you should mention that. Because Hunter came out, he attacked Goldust from the front, beat the holy living hell out of him, hit him with a pedigree and left him for dead. Funny how that works. I am not making that up. Yeah. <laughs> there was no he overwhelmed Goldust by himself. Yes. Kicked his ass. That's what he did. Marlena was wrong. Goldust was not more of a man Hunter would ever be. And then. After he beat the holy living hell out of Goldust and laid him out with a pedigree, after all that, Marlena slapped him. Then China appeared, grabbed Marlena in a bear hug, ragdolling her left and right. You know, I remember this. There's a lot of this stuff that I've just kind of blocked out of my mind because who gives a shit? But I remember vividly when China came out of the crowd and shook Marlena. And I think it's because it was so ridiculous. This was their idea of, this is how China is going to destroy Marlena. She's going to pick her up and shake her. And that's what she did. She shook her back and forth like a rag doll. And Marlena sold this like she'd been killed. It was such a preposterous attack. Well, it's not like she can slam her. 
And Marlena's ass was everywhere. I think that's the main. We did get a great thong shot here. I went out wound it thirty times when I was a kid. Yeah, that, that that's a good point. So security leads China away. Goldust by the end of this had recovered and tended to Marlena. Lawler somehow blamed this all on ECW. <laughs> well, you never know where this fan might have come from. The Headbangers versus in their raw de- <laughs> debut. <laughs> Matt and Jeff, the Hardy Boys. Oh, my God. I couldn't even believe this. I don't even know why they bothered having a match here, because during this match, we had a Farouk promo in the background. Yes. Where I believe he said that he walked two miles to school in the snow, uphill both ways when he was a child. Something like that. He wants a Chicago street fight with Ahmed Johnson. Mm -hmm. Then, I think there was something else we had here. There was a lot of talk on commentary about not the match. Yes. Yes. Matt Hardy, it was so funny because I've been watching Matt Hardy on Impact, and he moves exactly the same then that he does now. Mm -hmm. Just now he's a little slower. But you could totally, like, before I figured out it was the Hardys, I knew it was Matt. Just the way he moved and the things that he did. He's got a weird way of walking. A very Matt Hardy very way of walking. Bow-legged. He's got that arched back kind of posture. Yeah. And then they announced, and then I realized it was the Hardy, so I was like, oh my God. And then Jeff gets in, and sure as shit, Jeff has one thing he's got to do, which is get fucking killed. Takes a clothesline. On his a neck. Crazy flip bump onto his head. <laughs> no, on his neck. <laughs> Something made his on his neck and not his head. I don't know how. And then the headbangers do their, their combo leg drop deal, and he's just a dead body, and they pin him. And I was like, these guys are still wrestling today. Yeah. It's amazing. And let me tell you something. If you're not watching Impact, Matt Hardy, Tyrus, Matt's wife, Rebby, and baby Maxwell are the best. They're the new four horsemen. Really? (laughs) They're so fucking... I cannot even tell you how great they are. Matt is a crazy 40-year-old rich guy who's broken, but he's the champion, playing Ric Flair. And his diabolical wife, who's got the perfect face to make you think, this wife is not someone you want to mess with. And that includes Matt Hardy. They come out with their goddamn baby, who Tyrus holds during these promos, Baby Maxwell. It is the best act. I'm not even kidding. You've got to watch it. I will have to check that out. Since you brought up the subject, I saw a tweet today hyping up a Monsters Ball match. And in this tweet, there was a gif of uh, Eddie Edwards, who was on his knees, and he was poking his head through a steel chair. Both arms were free. And I believe it was Crazy Steve and a woman I don't know, but they were pouring tacks onto his head. <laughs> yeah. For like 20 seconds, as Eddie screamed. And all I could think was, why don't you, A, stand up. <laughs> I haven't seen this man. B, yet. pull your head out of the chair. C, use your right arm to fight back. D, use your left arm to fight back. There are so many things you could do other than leave your head under the shower of thumbtacks attacks, and scream. And so I retweeted it, just adding, this looks so stupid. Vinny, let me defend them. Okay. By talking about the baby class. There were thumbtacks involved? <laughs> no. They were talking about how sometimes your baby's going to cry, and you need to try to think of some ways to soothe the baby. And she gave us a whole bunch of different ways. You can wrap up the baby. Swaddle the baby. Not like, you know, swaddle the baby. <laughs> no other, other idea what you might think. You can feed the baby. Yeah. You can change the baby. You can you can uh, give the baby something to suck on. There's, there's, they give us a whole list of things. And then everybody had to stand in a circle. And she said, I'm going to play the sound of baby, a baby crying. And you guys are going to pass the baby around. And everybody will get about 10 seconds until the crying stops. And everybody has to try a different way of soothing the baby. And there's no, you can't repeat. So if the first person swaddles, you can't swaddle. So the further down the line you are, the less options you have. And you have to think. I was right in the middle. But anyway, she does it. And it turned out just fine. But she says afterwards, she says, sometimes during a situation like this, when the baby's crying, it's hard to think. So my analogy is when you're on your knees and crazy Steve is pouring thumbtacks 
over your head for 20 seconds, Vinny, it's hard to think. It's not the easiest thing in the world to just think, I'll fight back. He's probably thinking, when are these thumbtacks going to end? Why have they been falling on me for 20 seconds? Why is crazy Steve dressed like the Joker? Where's my fucking partner? Many things I'm sure were going through Eddie Edwards' head. This is the dumbest thing you've ever said. I haven't seen it yet. I'm so sure So back it was here on Raw 97, it was clear in five seconds Jeff was the best worker on the show to this point. He was. He took two bumps. Just the way he in the first five seconds of the match. Okay. And, and he did later bump onto his neck. And then the headbangers hit him with their finish, which I have seen twice now, and they have scooted up both times. Very talented guy. Did they ever get their finish right? I don't know. This was wrong? Yes. <laughs> Who cares? I'm not sure the guy doing the leg drop actually touched Jeff. This is much less interesting than the thumbtacks. Let's move on. Lawler asked Ross, have you ever seen a mosh pit? And Ross said, yes, on the news. The news? <laughs> and I had that reaction, and you had that reaction, and Lawler had that reaction. <laughs> what the fuck news story was he watching? I don't know. So yeah, the headbangers won. And they, they, they saw the headbangers and the Hardy Boys and thought the headbangers have more star talent. They were wrong. By the way, all you youngsters out there, we are about a quarter of a way through the download of Sunny. We're about to the top of her shoulders right now. Mm-hmm. Got quite a ways to go to get to them boobies. Yeah. Which are covered up, I might add. Yeah, it was, it was a PG-rated photo, too. Oh, yeah. She wasn't naked. No. It was America Online. It wasn't a big photo, either. No. Bret Hart versus Psycho Sid for the WWF title. The second time it was announced. Then Austin jumped Brett again backstage. At this point, they were looked like the most incompetent company in the world. How hard is it to not let this guy attack your champion? But no. They go to Gorilla Monsoon, the babyface president of the WWE. And he says, you know what, fans? We don't fuck you here in the WWF. We don't tease you with stuff and not deliver. We promised you a championship match, and that's exactly what we're going to have. I guarantee it. I thought... Man, I believe Gorilla Monsoon. That's true. He's a man of the people. He was a great babyface GM. Would be great if we had something like that nowadays, as opposed to these fuckers that hate us. Yeah. The other note here is that in this melee in the backstage, it was the only point on the show where Vince McMahon appeared, as he was trying to separate the uh, combatants. Flash Funk versus Owen Hart. We got Flash Funk's whole entrance, and the announcers just shut up for like a minute so he could watch his dancers dance and hear his dope song. Why do they have a match here either, since the whole thing was them on the phone with dot, 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 ECW representative, who ended up being Paul Heyman yeah. representing ECW. Who identified himself as the owner, operator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> let's, not get a, let's not talk to his, his PR guy. No. That is Paul. He was everything. I would also like to note before the phone call, Flash Funk in this match became the man with the shortest hair ever to be pulled down by the hair. <laughs> It's because it was Owen. Yes. Owen called a hair pull. Flash just went with it. So, yes, Paul Heyman gets on the phone. He accepts Lawler's challenge to appear in Manhattan next week. Lawler sarcastically asks, are you going to bring the Blue Meanie or the Sandman or Sabu? He said it just like I would. The Sandman. He did. <laughs> Sabu. And uh, Heyman dropped a line about Neighborhood Watch keeping an eye on Lawler. Wow. Yeah. And they finished up. Meanwhile, there was a very clunky match going on in the ring. And then they cut to Steve Austin. They Before that. So there's a match going on. There's a phone call with Paul Heyman. Then Owen starts bickering with Clarence Mason. Then Davey Boy comes to chase Mason to the back. Then Steve Austin appears. Too much going on here. Now, the other problem with this is Steve Austin has been running around like a lunatic for two hours, ruining your television show. So your solution is to give him mic time. <laughs> well, maybe they thought, if we can sequester him back here mm, and get him talking, interesting. he'll be distracted. That's, a much, that's, that's much better than that other dumb thing you said earlier. I learned that in the baby class. They were swaddling him. <laughs> and it worked for the, the moment. The good news is, you mentioned that half hour of quality stuff we saw. Steve Austin's promo qualifies. It was very good. It was a great promo. He buried Monsoon's authority. He buried Shawn Michaels' fake gimpy knee. Buried everyone else. Best thing in the show by a great margin. 
So Flash makes his comeback, hits his moonsault, Owen kicks out, and Bulldog clunks Funk with a slammy. No, before that, he hit a high cross off the top and a moonsault, and Owen kicked out of both of them. Yes. Does he have any finishes left that Owen Hart didn't kill in this match? Yeah, that one leg drop flip. I guess he did have that. Yeah. And a 450 splash. So then Funk is running the ropes. Bulldog clunks him with a slammy. Owen makes the cover. Bulldog help, holds the foot down. Owen wins. And for reasons I cannot fathom, Owen and Bulldog are still bickering as they head backstage. Well, they are, but it appears they're, they're, they've dropped the breakup angle because Sean isn't back for another four or five months, and they have a match with him when he comes back. Maybe it was, maybe it was uh, a couple months. But regardless, they're not breaking up imminently. I believe, well, I don't think they ever fully broke up. This felt like we'll, they dropped it. We'll find out. Yes. I, I, think, I think it will all be resolved shortly. They showed, oh, Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus Bart Gunn. As the two men were coming out, they showed China attacking Marlena at the pay-per-view. And the way they did it was Marlena was standing with her back to the uh, audience up against the guardrail, and China came through the crowd to grab her. You should have seen the people react to China. Yeah, did, did not, you see her? Yes. Man. They did not know what to make of her. So, as they're showing this, and the question is, did Triple H have something to do with this woman coming out and attacking Goldust woman? Lawler said, no, 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 no. Hunter only hangs out with beautiful women. He would never be seen with a woman who looked like this. Oh, wow. That is what Jerry Lawler said. Nobody get mad at me. Wow. So, Honky Tonk Man comes out. He, of course, is still searching for his new protege. Although, referring to China, he giggles and says she might be in Honky Tonk Man's category. <laughs> Different viewpoints. God, what a payoff this is going to have. <laughs> <laughs> what a payoff. I can't wait to see it. So, they do the intros. The bell is about to ring when Jim Ross chooses. This is a good time to interview Hunter. Yeah. Why not? He asked him about China and... Hunter says, I have women of all sorts chasing after me. I have no idea who that woman is, and I don't care. So they're doing a nothing match. They do hip tosses. They do arm drags. And then Goldust runs out to chase Hunter away, and Honky Tonk Man was out of, his, out of this world as a cheerleader on commentary. Quote, Goldust, look! Run, Helmsley! Run! Over the rail! Go outside! Hurry! I laughed. So Bart won via countout. Yes. DQ. Right? Bart ran wild. Hunter cut him off. Goldust ran in for the DQ. I, 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 Bart was announced as the winner. Ah, who fucking cares? That's a good point. Had an interview with James Andrews. This I must speak of. All right, have at it. I don't know if it was on the board or on the Twitter, but somebody was so mad at me when I was talking about Shawn Michaels' knee last week. They could not believe the audacity of me to not believe Shawn Michaels. There's no chance, they said, that some doctor didn't tell Shawn that he had to retire. Okay, listen. Dr. James Andrews on this show said Shawn didn't even need surgery. He didn't even need to have his knee scoped. He was going to do a little bit of rehab and be back in four weeks. So what fucking doctor would have told the guy you could never wrestle again? He didn't even need knee surgery. I'm not fucking making this up. That's what the doctor said. So, yes, I find it hard to believe that there was a doctor that told Shawn Michaels, you know what, your knee, which doesn't even need surgery, I don't think you can ever wrestle again, dude. Your and, career is over. And there's no way you can do an injury angle <laughs> or a quick roll-up finish to drop the title. You must forfeit it in a sad you speech. You must never do anything athletic again. Yes. You must never run. You must never lace up the boots. You must never put on tights. Jogging is out for you. This was hilarious. If you see an elliptical, turn around, go the other way. And James Andrews, the most serious thing James Andrews says was he goes, he left a rehab for four weeks. Eh, four to six weeks. <laughs> so he extended it you by two weeks. Caveat there. D yeah. Don't, 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 don't uh, overpromise. That was the most serious thing about this diagnosis. And the other thing, and we have said this before, but it's still true. Forget doctors or entertainers. The number of human beings who have been the top guy in their field for as long as James Andrews has been the top guy in sports surgery, very, 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 very short. 
Finally, on the third try, Bret Hart versus Psycho Sid. And in hindsight, I'm kind of sad this happened. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Sid. He's horrible. But we got to see Sid do a sunset flip over Sid the top did rope. Sid a sunset flip. You know what's amazing about this? And this really did amaze me. Brett is a great worker. I know some people will say Brett had the same match every time, blah, 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 blah. Listen, Brett was a great worker. And Brett understood how to get the most out of all of his opponents. He would take a guy, and just like I was talking about a couple of weeks ago, what can this guy do? Let's build a match around it. What can this guy not do? Let's not do any of that. Somehow, when putting this match together, Brett thought, I'll bet this guy can do a fucking sunset flip over the top rope on me in the ring. And he had him try. This was the funniest thing I have seen since last week when Steve Austin thought it would be a great idea to put Sid in a fucking abdominal stretch. And, Vinny, there's no fucking way. You haven't watched Raw. There's no way that it is a coincidence that on Raw, Big E tried to put Mark Henry in an abdominal stretch to the exact same fucking reaction. Mark Henry, don't bend! No. It had to be this show. So some other Sid highlights in this match. Everything he did. There, Some were even wackier than others, though. Brett attempted to do a back suplex. The first stage of which is essentially to have Sid put him in a headlock. So he tried to go into Sid's headlock. And he tried, and he tried, and he tried, and he tried, and he said, fuck this, and hit a Russian leg sweep instead. (laughs) I love Sid! I love when Sid goes to slam him, but he just kind of lifts him up, (laughs) like for a world's strongest slam, and then just dropped him. Yep. He didn't even go down with him. Nope. He just put him on the ground. Yep. There was the point where this whole thing had been delayed because Austin had injured Sid's leg. So Sid starts this match and his leg is fine. And then halfway through, he decides to start selling his leg, which would be fine, except he only sold the leg as Brett was working over his back. (laughs) Well, you know, the pain went down his leg. So Brett is being more heelish, as the storyline demands. He debuts the ring post figure four. He is wrapping Sid's leg in the ropes and cranking on it. So he takes Sid to the corner, and he, Sid's back is to the turnbuckles. Brett's back is to Sid, and Sid's leg is grapevined through the ropes, and Brett's pulling on it. So Sid, on one leg, with the other leg tangled in the ropes, has to fire back on Brett with clubbing forearms. One-legged Sid is a bad wrestler. Two-legged Sid. Yes. Can imagine one-legged. Brett goes for a high what cross near the this? finish. And hits the ropes like Sam Houston in 1986. He did it better. (laughs) Uh, I forgot the other Sid highlight. Sid decided it would be a good idea to hit Brett with a leg drop off the middle rope. When I say he decided this, that was on the mat. Once he got up on the ropes, you could see him think, what the fuck am I doing up here? And he thought about jumping down, but he, I guess, nutted up and just leapt off and collapsed. (laughs) He was trying to leg drop. Yeah. Hey, Let me give Sid some credit. There is a great worker named Robbie Brookside, who is now, in fact, working for WWE. That's right. Sid can lay claim to being put in a sharpshooter better than Robbie Brookside. Uh, We'll get to that. I don't know (laughs) what on earth that was. I don't know either, but good job, Sid. So For one second of your lifetime, you outworked Robbie Brookside. (laughs) Brett gets him in the sharpshooter. And then Steve Austin manages to hit Brett in the head with a chair without the referee noticing. And I was trying to figure out how this could be possible. (laughs) Seeing or hearing. Or hearing. And then I realized, that ref is Earl Hebner. Yep. (laughs) The fix was in all year. Man. So neither neither Earl nor Sid had any idea what happened. Sid hit Brett with a powerbomb and pinned him. And that was that. Complete with these super dramatic slow count. I know. I love Earl Hebner's slow count. Yeah. Sid's so, going to Mania. Sid is going to Mania. Undertaker came out for the big stare down. And that was how the show ended. Can I just say, and we've touched on this, but now that it is 100% official that Sean versus Brett is off for Mania, what a tragedy that is. Because 
The story of how both guys reacted to the title change and its fallout over the following year made perfect sense. Brett acted and behaved like a guy who felt like the company he had carried and everyone who worked there had turned their backs on him. True. And, and the fans. Yeah. Sean behaved and acted like a guy who had achieved his boyhood dream only to find out being champion often sucked and he had to fight monsters like Mankind and Vader and sit every month. And it was not as much fun as he thought it would be. It was all totally realistic and believable, and now it's all out the window. Oh, no, there's more to come. Fear not. Oh, well, that's true. And you know what? The story of this, just like the main event of fucking Raw on Monday, when shit goes down, Vince wants to see big dudes hitting each other. <laughs> Because the show ends with Sid and The Undertaker. His Bret Hart Shawn Michaels match is out the window. And so, well, fuck. Sid and The Undertaker. It's yeah. the only option. Yes. We can't put the title on Bret and then pass the torch to Steve Austin or vice versa. It's got to be the two big fuckers. Yes. That was how the show ended. Yeah. Cool. That was that. Let's play a song, then we'll do Nitro. By the way, that uh, sunny picture, you're still about six minutes away from it being fully downloaded. Go, Vinny. Oh, I guess I just got my notes open then. So, Raw, from 19 years ago, February 24th, 1997. Can I say this real quick? I was so looking forward to this because my memory of this show oh, was such... It's a famous show. I knew I, this was going to happen. That I absolutely could not wait to watch this because I remember how cool it was mm -hmm. in 1997. Boy, was I wrong. Sucked. God, this was so bad. A lot of it sucked. We'll get into it here. I didn't look back. I was not as big an ECW fan as a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I I didn't think it sucked at the time, but I, I was not, like, a fan. Like, when these guys showed up on Raw, it wasn't like I went and watched ECW television every week. Well, we didn't have it here. Well, let, let, we didn't let, have it, but we, I could have got tapes. We can put this in context, which is actually important. This was not quite the first ECW I ever saw. They were on a local, whatever the equivalent of Fox Sports would have been in 1990. They were on something here for a while. It was on Fox Sports for like Sports two months. For like two months. Yeah. And I had seen like half an episode, and the episode I saw was essentially nothing but 40 minutes of the gangsters and the Eliminators brawling. So that's all I had seen, and then I watched this show. I actually traded tapes, and I got their, their television monthly Yeah, from a guy in New York. Yeah, so you, you would have seen a lot more than me. This is my very... For all intents and purposes, this is my first exposure to ECW wrestling. So, wrestling. Well, it's true. So let's begin. I felt like Jerry Lawler watching this show. <laughs> yeah. The Godwins versus the new Blackjacks. Godwins didn't even get an entrance. Let me put this into context. Right. Let's be fair. Okay. The ECW on this show pretty much sucked. It was still better than the WWF on this See, show. See, this is what I'm getting at with this. I, <laughs> because I was not, I was not floored by ECW of any means on this, but my God, it was so much the better half. On a scale of 1 to 10, mm -hmm. the WWF stuff was a 1, yes. and the ECW stuff was between a 2 and a 2.5. And that's fair. There was nothing resembling a 10 on this show. Oh, that's that's for sure. That's for sure. But I, 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 I don't know. I don't think I'm, I don't think I minded any of the ECW stuff. But we'll get into it. But the WWF stuff was awful. The new Blackjacks in 1997. Two guys come out shirtless and chaps with big thick mustaches. Maybe that's the. Uh, I don't know if it's the same impression in '97 they had when Blackjack Lanza and Blackjack Mulligan came out. But it's them against the Godwins. Had a long match. It was boring mostly. Ken Shamrock. Was shown in the front row from the UFC, they said. Man, he's aged. It's been a long 20 years. It's been years. 20 years. I look the same. No, you don't. We saw a picture of you in the front <laughs> row at Raw. You look like a little boy. So, a uh, chance of Hogan sucks. The first die Rocky sign, I believe, in Raw history. Bradshaw, probably in the best shape of his career, whatever that's worth. And he went back and forth a while. Bradshaw hit Phineas with a close night from hell. Wyndham made a cover, Phineas got a foot on the ropes, the ref counted three anyway, and that is how the Blackjacks win in their debut. They had to protect the Farmers. Yeah. The Godwins. They could not get a clean pin in their first match in. And oh. then a ref ran out to protest this, and the ref who got it wrong got slopped. This sucked. At one point, Bradshaw whipped Phineas in. Phineas took the corner. Bradshaw ran in, and Phineas caught him in a head scissors and took him over with a 
head scissors to the outside. Yeah. It was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. This match sucked. It did. It did. So they went to break. When they came back, there was a guy in the ring just randomly checking turnbuckles. The Eliminators came through the crowd. Plays went nuts for that. And they grabbed the guy for total elimination. And time froze. <laughs> so the three men made sure they were all... No one moved, by the way, so they're all in position. And then the poor guy taking the move had to stand there like a dumbass for seconds, waiting for them to kick him. He stood there, held his breath, closed his eyes, With and his then they hit their on move. His head. Yeah, yeah. And they hit their move on him, and Paul Heyman came around and said, ECW is accepting, accepting Jerry Lawler's challenge. This show, can you imagine if there was some low-level podcast and you, Vinny, got really mad at them? And you said, I issue an open challenge to come on to our show next week. And so Don't get any ideas, Ed. I am sitting here, and I've got everything that we got to review on the show. And all of a sudden, a bunch of numbskulls barge in through that door, grab mics, and they start doing their show. And I'm just sitting here going, hey, <laughs> these geeks accepted Vinny's challenge. Cool. What the fuck was Vince doing? These guys came want- in in storyline. Yeah. And they took over Raw. Yes. Vince didn't say, I was contacted by Paul Heyman earlier today, and we are going to feature four ECW matches. He didn't say, Half the crew is in Germany. I am desperate for, for TV time. Nope. Nope. He's just running his show, and all of a sudden these numbskulls show up, and they start putting on their fucking matches. Yeah. And he's just sitting there like, Cool. With their graphics. But he's <laughs> not even a fan. He's, no. he's, he's like. I can't even explain it. He's like a gracious host where a bunch of stupid shit's happening Mm -hmm. and he doesn't care enough to actually watch it. Like he's ignoring half of it. He has no idea what's going on. He's just letting him run roughshod over the show. And then Lawler is practically getting in a fist fight with the guy and he's just sitting there in between him as his show is going all to hell. (laughs) This was preposterous. It's funny too with your analogy. There's you know there's one drunk guy that you know always making a scene, and the last thing we see on the show is the Sandman coming in. Basically, yeah. So yes, we got little Guido versus Big Stevie Cool. Oh my God! I don't know what was up with the ECW guys' music. Obviously, they were using a lot of unlicensed, well-known songs. Right. Um, but- no, they were all they were all uh, they were all. Very close, but they were ripoffs. It was not Man in a Box. They changed like three chords. I think maybe. Well, obviously on the ECW TV show, it was Man in the Box. Yes. Yeah. They were blatantly here. They edited. They edited in their very close ripoff of Man in the Box and the BWO's music and uh, Kiss for Taz and all that. So Vince McMahon marking out for the Blue World or- Blue World Orders comedy. This is where I just... My mind broke. <laughs> I, I, I just was... I, I, I could not even... These guys come out. God bless them all. The first thing we see from e- ECW, by the way, the BWO. A huge fat guy, a skinny guy pretending to be Shawn Michaels, who what? I guess was actually supposed to be... Diesel. Diesel? Diesel? Yeah. Whatever the Kevin fuck Nash. he was supposed to be. And then they're fake Shawn Waltman, and they're out there as the... I and, mean, they're, and they're fake Hogan. Think about this. And six. If anybody listening to this right now ever played the NWO for Halloween, they probably looked more like them than these three guys did. And they're out there in whatever their gear is, looking as indie-rific as humanly possible, and Stevie Richards, as skinny as can be, in his Daisy Dukes, in his cut-off tank top, yeah. screams, we're taking over! And Vince goes, ha ha ha! And Vince could not like, even what the fuck. Vince could not even bring himself to mention the NWO. He says there's a obviously a ripoff of the NWO clothing line. Ah, uh, yeah. Not 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 the other show. No, that's on right now. At the same time as you, the clothing line, NWO. So they're out there, just being wacky. They do not look like superstars. No, at all. <laughs> And Paul's doing commentary. And they do a match, and Raven comes out to watch with his belt on, and it just looks so staged. Vince calls 
Stevie Richards, Stevie Ray. Yeah. They cut to the back for a random interview with Goldust, who looks so far gone. This was a bad promo. Oh, my God. This was a very, very God. bad promo. And then we have a Stevie kick finish on the show where Shawn Michaels, until he lost his smile, had been God. And Vince let this guy do a Stevie kick for a finish on Raw. This was the craziest thing I've ever seen. It was very and weird. not in a good way. I couldn't believe this aired on television. I thought it was a fine match for three minutes. I did, it did amuse me. This is something that people complain about in have complained about in WWF and WWE for 20 years, but it's true everywhere. Little Guido was very clearly the better wrestler in this match. But Stevie was taller and had better hair and was a better talker. Therefore, Stevie was in the main event of the pay-per-view and Guido wasn't on the show. Hmm. So that was that. Sonny did a backstage promo making fun of Marlena for having bad ribs. And then... Oh, my God. Sonny and Marlena had an arm wrestling match segment that must have lasted at least a half hour. Where did I? Where did the Sonny heel turn come from? Did I miss that? I don't think she was ever a baby face, really. She wasn't? No. She came out every single solitary week and was cheered wildly. She's hot. But she was a heel? Yeah. Well, they did a hell of a job with that one. <laughs> I don't tell you, dude. So. Why? <laughs> if she never did anything, and she was hot, and everybody cheered her, why was she a heel? Because she had been before that. She was the manager of the Body Donnas, and they were heels. In she, 1995? She did call the people fat here. Yeah, she was a heel. I see. She was doing the Rick Rude, yeah. She did a blatant Rick Rude ripoff. It was hysterical, because she comes out, and she's got the robe on, and she cuts the Rick Rude promo, and she starts doing the tease of taking off the robe, and flashing the crowd, and closing it again. And she finally drops the road, and it, she's wearing, like, wrestling gear. Hot pants and a top. Yeah, it was top, yeah. 1% more revealing than just any other outfit. She was the anti-Roman Reigns. Because I guess she was a heel, but everything she did was cheered. Yes. On every show. Yes. Marlena comes out in a gold thong leotard over black stockings. Sonny says, you have bad ribs. I will give you a chance to forfeit. I'll take the cheap victory, she says. Marlena won't do it. She instead makes a joke about Sonny being a prostitute. Hmm. Says she would get off her deathbed to arm wrestle Sonny. And Sonny stalled. She stalled again. Marlena stalled. Honky's making jokes about wanting to go backstage and drink. <laughs> there was a lot of it back there, I that presume, on this show. God, I don't blame him. At last, they start to arm wrestle, and they go back and forth. Honky is doing commentary and cheerleading. And Marlena is about to win. In the most sexualized manner possible. Yeah, he kept telling Grips, the girls, get a nice firm going. grip there. I, I should add, by the way, they did not have like an arm wrestling table or desk, whatever you call that thing. They just brought in like a knee-level footstool and had the girls bend over and put their arms on it. I'm not, yes. compl I'm not complaining. <laughs> what did you expect? Just an observation. Over the top. <laughs> Scott Norton would have been very disappointed in this arm wrestling contest. They ran a thousand seat building. They're not spending any money on a fucking arm wrestling table. <laughs> so, so Marlena's about to win when Sonny throws powder in her eyes. And as you noted, they're in a 1,000 seat building. It's small. And you can hear one fan shout out, You fucking bitch! Over and over. <laughs> he was outraged. Sonny had cheated in this arm wrestling contest. So for some reason, Savio Vega came out to harass the blinded Sonny. And Goldust came out to make the save. And sadly, this led to a match. <laughs> Savio came out and went after Melina. Or whatever her name is. That's Marlena. Her. There you go. Yeah. That's why Goldust well, Melina was out. 10. <sighs> yeah. Then, then this fucking match. Goldust and Savio. Let's talk about Miguel Perez. <laughs> <laughs> I, we've been watching Retro Raw now for months. Maybe even a whole year. Has Miguel Perez been on this show one time? I think so, because I think he had a really great match. He was on WCW. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah. Hmm. He is. He went to the wrong building? <laughs> That's for, I can believe these, that. All these fans also went to the wrong building. He was the one wearing the sweater and the tights. Oh, that's right. He was the hairy one. Yes. Okay. Well, regardless, this well, he was has his... hair in his mouth, apparently. This cause... is his raw debut. 
He was on commentary. He had nothing to say and a very uninteresting way of saying it. Incredibly bland and boring. His promo in Spanish that he cut on, on Savio for how disappointed everyone in Puerto Rico was. Him speaking Spanish was better than him speaking English. Right. Let me talk about how, how much his match sucked real quick. I wrote, match was boring and involved a lot of chin locks. They had a boring match. Yeah. And in the middle of the match, Goldust gets sent outside. Crush is outside. So normally you see a man thrown outside and the heel on the outside hits him. Or throws him into the steps. Or posts him. Not okay. fucking Crush. No, sir. Crush grabs him and plants him with a fucking pile driver on the outside. And then throws him back in the ring. And the match keeps going. Yes. It's just a move. Yes. And they go on and on and on and on and on until we get a fucking disqualification. <laughs> There's all, a lot of uh, that all squeezing and nerve holds by Savio. It was not good. So were... from the WWE side, we had a pinfall with a man's foot underneath the ropes. Uh-huh. And we've got a disqualification so far. For no reason. So that's that's two for two shit finishes. It's not like even Goldust had a pin. They were, they were brawling and Crushes ran in and hit him. Yeah, it was during this match... I looked down to see how far are we, are we into this? How long do we have to go? 30 minutes gone. That's where I got bored. Perez made the save. He drop kicked Savio out of the ring. Crowd was cheering him because they were wrestling fans, but they had no idea who he was. Well, he did the only good move of the match. He had a missile drop that kick. That's also true. And he showed, they were in the Manhattan Center, so they showed Tiny Tim appearing on Raw in that building in 1993. Jerry Lawler goes to interview Ken Shamrock. Oh, my God. Lawler kept saying, I know that guy. That's Ken Shamrock, the ultimate fighting champion, blah, blah, blah. I know he's a heel. I understand that when he's on commentary, maybe he'll lie to make himself look better. But he goes over to Ken Shamrock, and he wants Ken Shamrock to tell everybody how they used to train together, and he taught him all of his submission moves. And Shamrock says, I don't know who you are. Lawler's shocked and embarrassed. What the fuck did the Jerry Lawler character <laughs> yes! expect to happen? That is my good question. What was his plan? Yeah, what the fuck was his plan? Did he think he'd be plan? so smooth that he'd, he'd <laughs> manipulate Ken Shamrock? Did he think he was going to hypnotize him in the yes! middle of this interview and cause him to lie? So, Shamrock... I could not for the life of me understand the motivation of the Jerry Lawler character. Shamrock did not look sober here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's all I'm saying. But uh, he was confused, much as he had been during that uh, Savio match, by the way. He often looked confused when they showed him. And uh, he said, I don't know you. You're a liar. And Lawler says, I can't believe you're trying to embarrass me like this. And again, I know he's a heel. There's a middle-aged man wearing a crown on TV. (laughs) Anyway. This was so bad. Mikey Whipwreck versus Taz. This actually, as a match, was the best thing on the show. It was the only thing good on the show. I love Taz. (laughs) It wasn't even much of a match. I could watch Taz suplex geeks all day. He did, I believe it was a Northern Lights here where his own head almost ended up between his feet. It was awesome. Heyman's promo before the match noting this show has sucked without ECW. True. It wasn't a whole hell of a lot better with ECW. Well. Let's be honest. Yeah. So Lawler buries Taz for being short. Heyman buries Lawler for being short and old. Sabu came out to the dive off the raw sign. Oh, my God. No, no, no. <laughs> so these guys are having a decent two-minute match, which essentially is just Taz suplexing this fucker all over the place. In the middle of this two minutes, it is imperative for some reason that they go backstage to interview Farouk. Yeah. Who thunders on and on about Fuck off only knows what. No one's paying any attention to him or the match now. Yes. So this is the most useless split screen of all time. I actually forgot to even write this down. So then, as he's ranting, they go back to the ring for Sabu's big debut. Let's talk about what really happened. (laughs) Sabu is in the balcony. No, no. He's in the balcony. No, he's on top of the raw sign. Whatever the fuck. He's high in the air. He's in the crow's net. It doesn't matter. The point is he's way above He's way above the entrance area. That's all that matters. Then he just falls. Yes. 
Well, he attempted to leap and lost See, his footing and the, the, tripped. The raw sign is not designed first. for jumping off of. Therefore, it was wobbly. Now, why did he fall? Because apparently there were just some guys, and he decided to jump on them in the middle of a match. So he jumps on the guys, and they all fall down. He jumped on Taz's team. Team Taz. Team Taz. Yeah. Heyman's going crazy trying to sell all of this. Vince McMahon with his spectacles on, it doesn't even know where he's at. This is 19 years ago, by the way. Yes. Sabu heads over to the ring, and tab- Taz decides, I'm going to suplex Mikey over the top rope on a Sabu. Fucking botches it like you'd never saw before. Yeah. Mikey tumbles over the ropes, falls down. 18 men topple like dominoes. <laughs> Geeks take Sabu away, and then Taz sets up for the head and arm Tazplex. And he grabs Mikey. And Heyman is... He's bursting at the seams. He's like, you're going to see the head and arm Tazplex. And he hooks him up. And he hooks him up. And finally, Taz just sort of drops him on his head. And Vince goes, what's that called? (laughs) And Paul rewinds. And he goes, that's the head and arm Tazplex. You got to imagine Heyman just out of his fucking mind, turning blue and purple. And Vince just sitting there. Not knowing what the fuck's happening. And then Taz put him in the Katahajime and beat him. This show was a disaster. But you know what? Wow. I will say one thing about this show. It was not boring. No. <laughs> well, it was no. not boring. The ECW stuff was not boring. True. The WWF stuff was incredibly boring. And you know why the ECW stuff wasn't boring? Because it may as well have been a fight. It may as well have been a shoot. Yeah. Every fucking crazy thing was happening. In every moment of every match. It was like watching that Bellator fight the other night. It was! It actually was. That's a great great uh, uh, comparison. Every fight, every fight was, was Kimbo versus Dada 5000. <laughs> I just know that at the time, I was so excited to see a whole league of new men. That, that was cool. It did, uh, that's all that matters, that they were new. There's a lesson to be learned there, too, by the way. Vince has been plugging a big surprise all night long. It wasn't enough that ECW invaded. It wasn't enough that Ken Shamrock debuted. He also brought in the Legion of Doom. He matched them up against the head, the uh, headbangers. So you're thinking, okay, it'll be like WCW Saturday Night all over again. They'll win in three minutes. Couldn't even do that. No. Give it, me ten minutes. They did for a while, and then Hawk got cut off. They beat him up for a long time. And the headbangers suck. And then, after all that, we have a... Double count out. Yeah. And after the double count out, the Legion of Doom hits the goddamn Doomsday device anyway. Yeah. Why the fuck couldn't they beat the Headbangers? I don't know. It was a badly booked show. It was terrible. This was the return of the Legion of Doom. Yeah. They went to a double count out with the Headbangers. Yes. On a show that already had two fuck finishes in (laughs) WWE matches. We are now... Three for three in shitty finishes. There was a point in the match where the crowd started to chant Nitro sucks. Bischoff Very... sucks. Hogan sucks. Yeah. and No, there were chants of this show sucks. I didn't hear that. No, you I didn't. did. You did not hear that. I bet you I did. Anyway, somebody, uh, Lawler said something, and <laughs> Vince claims there is no censorship of posters or saying in the WWF. Well, I'm still hung up on this show sucks. You're telling me they didn't say that. They didn't say that. What were they thinking in the middle of the Legion of Doom versus the Headbangers that compelled them to talk about how WCW sucked? Well, it was boring. They had to talk about something. Let me tell you something. WCW was way better than this fucking show. That's for sure. This show did not need to be two hours. No. And before anyone says, Brian, you're so hard on this show, but half the crew was in Germany. Who the fuck sent him to Germany on a Monday? Yes. Eric? Eric? (laughs) <laughs> Paul? No. So Vince notes that Shawn Michaels and Mark Merrow are out with, and I quote, really bad knees. <laughs> Very specific medical info. Where was Shane McMahon to come back and save the company from all these injuries back here in 97? This led to, tell me a lie. Craig, did you mark out when Shane McMahon returned? I had a mild mark out on the, on the really? couch there. I mean, not. I didn't 
jump out of my skin or anything, but I was like, hey, look at that. There's that guy. That's about it. Okay. You haven't seen it yet, Vinny? I've only seen it in GIF form. I, it was pretty unavoidable. It, it was funny, too, because my, my son, I'm like, hey, that's Shane McMahon. And my son goes, who? Exactly. Yes. He hasn't been around. The last time he was on television, There's he, someone was in two, diapers. he was two years old. Yeah. And I did laugh at the story where Shane came out in a, a suit and sneakers. and uh, Jordans. Oh, <laughs> forgive me. Jordans. Yeah. Expensive sneakers. But uh, I believe it was Seth Mates. There's one of the former writers who said, Shane once yelled at me for wearing sneakers with my suit. Yeah, because he was stealing Shane's gimmick. I see. Tell me a lie. Here, tell me a lie. This was not the first time it aired. But uh, all I could think watching this sentimental malarkey was, boy, all those fans who've been booing Shawn Michaels, this will turn them around for sure. Oh, yeah. This will solve everything. Fuck, they should play this on Raw for Roman Reigns after he got his damn nose broken. (laughs) He should. Just have shots throughout history of his nose. (laughs) Fourth tragedy struck. That'd be a great video. Here's his, here was his nose as a youth. Growing up in Florida. Devon Dudley versus Tommy Dreamer. In the first minute, we had multiple ball shots and multiple weapon shots. How skinny was Devon Dudley? Holy cow. Skinnier than he is now? Much. Yeah. So was Tommy. Actually, much. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> Who's so, anyone not skinnier? Same man. Bubba was twice the size. Bubba was huge, yeah. Got great calves, though. <laughs> That's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. Total garbage match. I, it, yeah, this was this was garbage wrestling, if ever there was one. There was stairs and a cane, and they're trying to identify weapons pulled out of the crowd. Frying pans. Frying pans. Many nut shots. Let me talk about the end. All right. They do all of this garbage, and suddenly it is imperative that we show a backstage promo with The Undertaker. And as they go to the split screen, in the background... Beulah has gotten involved. There's a Dreamer DDT. Bubba Ray hits the ring. There's a 3D on Dreamer. All of this, the finish happening while yeah. Undertaker is rambling about a shitty main event he's about to have. Yeah. And <laughs> Heyman is turning purple. It's Beulah McGillicuddy. It's the fucking Sandman. And Vince McMahon just calmly says, The who? You know who does a really bad Paul of Heyman impression? I do. <laughs> it's half Paul Heyman, half Vince, is what it is. So, Vince yes. does not give a shit about one goddamn thing that's happening in the big culminating angle of Paul Heyman's appearance on Raw to plug his pay-per-view. Yeah. Vince Vince doesn't even know what planet he's on right now. Vince was not impressed, nor was he unimpressed. He had no reaction. He was merely mild, mildly confused to all of this. But, uh, uh, yes, we got more nut shots, more chair shots, a pinfall, a 3D, Sandman coming through the crowd. Kane shots, and Sandman and Dreamer finally cleared the ring, and that was the big end of ECW. And, uh, yeah, that was a lot, a big mess. And uh, first, this is not the first time I've seen a guy hit with a hit in the head with a chair lately, but first time I've seen a bunch of them in one match in oh. a long time. Don't need to see it. Fuck. It's not fun anymore. And then when it's all over, Paul Heyman, on commentary, turns and he says, Mr. McMahon, I just want to thank you for letting us come on this show and plug our pay-per-view. I don't care what anyone says. You have more cojones than anyone ever gave you credit for. It was a very sincere thank you. Yeah. And then Lawler jumps all over him. And then he jumps all over Lawler. And there's a big, giant pull-apart brawl. And Vince McMahon, grandfatherly, bespectacled Vince McMahon, is right in the middle of this, getting smashed and destroyed. And they fade to black. Like, a riot is breaking on the Manhattan Center. And they come back commercial, and Vince is calmly sitting there, Quite the segment. Yeah. So you're not impressed with Vince, really. Coming up next. It no, was, Vince was just like out to lunch. It was Vince's How performance. How did he let this on his show? More than ECW is than you hate, that you hated. This whole show was just a fucking disaster. I thought this pull apart was awesome. It was an amazing disaster. Yeah. Well, this was like the first thing because Lawler ended up in the ECW arena in a cage match with the ECW guys later on. Yeah. That was good he stuff. showed up, I think, in their second pay-per-view, if I remember right. Because uh, the man understands yeah. business. Oh, yes. And money. Yes. Had a recap of all the many encounters last week between Bret Hart, Psycho Sid, and Steve Austin, which culminated in Sid beating Bret for the championship. And then we had clips of Bret throwing a profane tantrum backstage, hunting for Austin and cursing out cameramen. 
Todd Pettengill came out to do a real interview with Ken Shamrock. He said he was enjoying an exciting show in and out of the ring. Introduced his wife. I'll say. Introduced his father. Pettengill asked him for a prediction in the WrestleMania main event. Who's going to win, Psycho Sid or The Undertaker? And Ken Shamrock, bless his heart, analyzed this cartoon like it was sport. Good. He said, I'm picking The Undertaker. Why? Is it because he has unknown un- undead powers? No. Is it because it's his time? No. He has better technique and balance. It's true. It, uh, it's abundantly true, but it still sounds so <laughs> bizarre on this show especially. I loved when they pulled him about Brett versus Austin, and history tells us that Brett versus Austin at WrestleMania was a brilliant double turn. In reality, when they asked him about this, Everybody cheered Steve Austin, and they booed Bret Hart. This was an easy fucking double turn. Yeah, that is true. That is true. He refused to make a prediction in the submission match, which, of course, he would end up refing down the line. So it's time for Undertaker versus Farouk. Oh, fuck. Farouk stopped to confront Austin, said the UFC is cat fighting, and the WWF, we don't have cats, we have tigers, and he dared him to step in the ring and prove he was a man. And Shamrock said Farouk was a goof, trying to intimidate him, surrounded by a gang. Didn't know how to fight one-on-one, and if Vince wanted to put something together, he'd have, he'd have no problem with it. And a panicked Vince hurried to break. That was a good promo. That was a great promo. Much better than anything else he'd done on the show. So they stalled forever. Farouk worked over the leg for about nine hours. Take or me to come back, nobody cared. Match stopped for a while. And take her nose little pile driver, and the nation hit the ring for the DQ. I believe they went four for four. Four for four in shitty finishes and WWE matches on this classic edition of Raw. Now listen, maybe you didn't enjoy the ECW stuff as much as I did. That's fine. Will you admit what a complete, miserable, nightmare, disaster of a show this would have been if you took those segments out? Well, we don't know what they would have replaced it with. Based on what they did put in. (laughs) They may have replaced it with Sid promos. And Bret Hart matches, and Owen and Bulldog. I'm and guessing that Steve if, Austin. If Austin and Bret and Owen and Bulldog were available, we wouldn't have gotten the Black Jacks. Yeah. So don't ever send him to fucking Germany again. But they did, and so it would have been worse. All I'm saying is the worst ECW thing on here was much better than the best uh, WWF thing. That's the lowest praise. Fine. I've ever heard. I'll, listen, I said it was a memorable show, and it was not boring. What the fuck more do you want? To admit that the WWF stuff is worse than the I said stuff. that! Okay. But it was all bad. I don't agree. I like Taz. Okay, fine. Taz and Mikey Whipwreck for two minutes was not bad. There you go. Are you all happy now? Craig, are you happy? <laughs> You'd like to add, Craig? I don't care. Wow. <laughs> How Did you and I switch spots here? What happened? No, no. I just, who cares? Let's go. Who cares? I'm arguing with you, and he's apathetic. I'm, I'm shocked. I think he just doesn't want to talk about it because he has such fond memories as a child, and then he watched it again and was like, wow. Thank you for speaking for me. I appreciate what that. What the hell? Well, tell us then. Play a song. <laughs>